The various ecological systems on Earth can be described from the amount and type of plants that are present. There is the Arctic tundra where, for the most part, no plant life exists until the ice melts and vegetation starts to grow. There is also the tropical rainforest where plant life is most abundant and plant species are most diverse. In the coniferous forests, the tallest trees can be found. There is also the dry desert where plants are adapted to exist despite the lack of water. Since plants are highly diverse, there are different ways in which they acquire all the necessary resources in order for them to grow. Plant, like all life forms on Earth, is carbon-based. We live in a carbon-based Earth because all the living creatures are built on a framework of carbon atoms. Most of the carbon that is utilized by living creatures exists in the form of carbon dioxide, which is present in the atmosphere. Plants use this in the process of photosynthesis. The sun is the primary source of energy for photosynthesis, where carbon dioxide and water are converted to glucose. C3 plants employ the Calvin-Benson cycle, wherein carbon dioxide is fixated into 3-carbon phosphoglycerate. The drawback to this is that the process is less efficient because its C3 catalyst, Rubisco, participates in a separate carboxylation process. When oxygen is absent, fermentation occurs, which enables glucose to be converted into lactic acid and ATP. A reverse process to photosynthesis is called cellular respiration. It occurs in all living cells, including both plants and animals. Here, carbohydrates like glucose are broken down to release carbon dioxide, water, and energy which is stored as ATP. Photosynthesis is influenced by the amount of light that reaches the plant. There are times when the amount of light declines to a point where the rate of carbon uptake is equal to the rate of carbon loss and respiration, termed as light compensation point. At this level, rate of net photosynthesis is zero. When light levels exceed the light compensation point, the rate of photosynthesis likewise increases. However, at a certain point, the increase in the amount of light no longer instigates an increase in photosynthesis. This means the plant has met its light saturation point. For some plants, excess light can cause a negative effect to its photosynthetic rate. Photoinhibition or overloading of light is common in plants that are found in shaded environments. Two major physical processes employed in photosynthesis are called diffusion and transpiration. The carbon dioxide found in the atmosphere enters the leaf through the pores called stomata. This is possible because in the fusion, the substance moves from an area of higher concentration to a lower one. During the day, the demand for carbon dioxide lessens, resulting to the closing of the stomata. This is to reduce the loss of water to the atmosphere or a process called transpiration. Humidity affects the amount of water loss because water vapor is transpired and diffused in a similar mechanism as carbon dioxide. Dry air causes the water inside the leaf to diffuse to the outside air more rapidly. The loss of water through transpiration is compensated by the uptake of water from the soil. If the water is not replaced, the plant will wilt and die. Trigger pressure is the force exerted outward on a cell wall by the water contained within the cell. Plant cells work more efficiently and grow more when trigger pressure is at a maximum or when the plant is properly hydrated. Decline of water content results in the drop of trigger pressure, which will later cause the wilting of the plant due to water stress. Water moves from the soil into the roots, up through the stems and leaves, and out into the atmosphere. Plants draw water from the soil where water potential is highest and is released through the leaves into the atmosphere where it is lowest. As water evaporates through the stomata during transpiration, there is a reduction in water potential in the roots, allowing more movement of water from the soil to the plant. 
The loss of water and the process of transpiration creates moisture conservation problems for plants because they need to open their stomata in order to absorb carbon dioxide but also need it to be closed in order to conserve water. A major distinction between terrestrial and aquatic plants in carbon dioxide uptake and digestion is the lack of stomata in submerged plants. Aquatic plants have a direct diffusion of carbon dioxide from the water adjacent to the leaf. Plants have optimal temperatures wherein photosynthesis occurs, and anything beyond photosynthesis declines. There is also a direct relationship between plant respiration and leaf temperature. Therefore, we can say that leaf temperatures have an effect on photosynthesis and respiration. The heat gained and lost in the environment influences the internal temperature of all plant parts. Plants have the ability to absorb both short and long wave radiation and reflect some of it back to its environment. The difference between plants is the net radiation balance. Plants make use of absorbed radiation and photosynthesis, and whatever remains must be either stored as heat or dissipated through evaporation. The force exerted outward on a cell wall by the water contained in the cell is called turgor pressure. The growth rate of plant cells and the efficiency of their physiological processes are highest when the cells are at maximum turgor, that is, when they are fully hydrated. When the water content of the cell declines, turgor pressure drops and water stress occurs, ranging from the weighting from the wilting to dehydration, for leaves to maintain maximum turgor, the water lost to the atmosphere and transpiration must be replaced by water taken up from the soil through the root system of the plant and transported to the leaves. The measure of energy available to do work is called Gibbs Free Energy, named for the American physicist Willard Gibbs, who first developed the concept in the 1870s. The osmotic and matrix potentials will always have a negative value, while the turgor pressure component can be either positive or negative. Thus, the total potential can be either positive or negative depending on the relative values of the individual components. For the continued movement of water from the soil into the roots, through the plant to the leaves, and from the leaves to the atmosphere, through the process of transpiration, the following condition must hold. For a given water content, the matrix potential of soil is influenced strongly by its texture. Soils composed of fine particles such as clays have a higher surface area for water to adhere to than sandy soils do. Clay soils therefore maintain more negative matrix potentials for the same water content. As soil water potential becomes more negative, the root and leaf water potentials must decline to maintain the potential gradient. Terrestrial and aquatic plants have many things in common, but the ways they get air, food, and water chains along with the environment in which they live. One difference between terrestrial and aquatic plants is that some aquatic plants can also use bicarbonate as a carbon source. However, the plants must first convert it to carbon dioxide using the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. This conversion can occur in two ways. Number one, active transport of bicarbonate into the leaf followed by conversion to carbon dioxide or Number two, exertion of the enzyme into adjacent waters 
and subsequent uptake of converted carbon dioxide across the membrane. The decline in net photosynthesis with declining leaf water potentials results primarily from stomatal closure. As the water content of the soil declines, the plant must reduce the leaf water potential to maintain the gradient so that water can move from the soil to the roots and from the roots to the leaves. To maintain internal temperatures within the range of tolerance, plants must exchange heat with the surrounding environment. Terrestrial plants exchange heat by convection and evaporation. Aquatic plants do so primarily by convection. The temperature of the leaf, not the air, controls the rate of photosynthesis and respiration. And leaf temperature depends on the exchange of energy between the leaf and its surrounding environment. Plants absorb both short wave and long wave radiation. Plants reflect some of the solar radiation and emit long wave radiation back to the atmosphere. Living organisms experience changes in temperature in the environments where they live in. Some changes follow a regular pattern, some don't. In response to variations in environmental temperatures, plants exhibit both acclimation and adaptation. Genetics play a big role in the way a plant species adapt to a cold environment. Cold tolerance generally differs among species. On the other hand, the ability to tolerate high air temperatures is greatly related to plant moisture balance. Periods of extreme heat or cold can directly damage plant cells and tissues, which is why several plants have undergone evolution that resulted in an array of physiological and morphological mechanisms that enable plant species to adjust to the prevailing environmental temperatures. In extremely cold environments, for example, plants acquire frost hardiness through the formation or addition of protective compounds in the cell, where this compound's function is antifreeze. Now let's talk about how a plant adapts to nutrient availability. Availability of nutrients directly affects a plant's survival, growth, and reproduction. Nitrogen is important because rubisco and chlorophyll are nitrogen-based compounds essential to photosynthesis. Uptake of nitrogen and other nutrients depend on availability and demand. Plants with high nutrient demands grow poorly in low nutrient environments, while plants with lower demand survive and grow slowly in low nutrient environments. Plants adapted to low nutrient environments exhibit lower rates of growth and increased longevity of leaves. Plants also exhibit adaptations to wetland environments. Plants intolerant of flooding exhibit symptoms similar to those of trout. Plants also experience reduced oxygen availability to the roots, disrupting metabolic processes and changing patterns of root growth. In waterlog environments, ethylene may increase, stimulating root cells to form interconnected gas-filled chambers. These chambers permit the exchange of oxygen between submerged and aerated roots. Plants adapted to waterlogged environments have glass-filled chambers that carry oxygen from the leaves to the roots. In this video, we learn that plants have special features that allow them to survive in a particular place or habitat. These features are called adaptations. The way one plant species adapts to certain environmental conditions may differ from the way another species does. This explains why some plants are found in one area, but not in another. Different plants are found in deserts, grasslands, rainforests, taiga, tundra, and in water, because each one of them adapts to the environment differently, and how well they adapt dictates their growth and survival.